Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Empowering Musicians podcast. And I am your host, Michael Manley. And this week, we are going to explore the question of why do artists need a union anyway? And this is a question that has come up uh, a lot of times. I'll have colleagues who are very far away from the union movement, and they'll say things to me like, um, you know, well, I understand why unskilled labor or you know, other workers might need a union, but you're a professional. Um, and I, I always sort of point to nurses, teachers, Google uh, employees, and um, all of these examples of where that's just simply not true. And there's this kind of bias and it's a little bit elitist attitude that somehow if you are uh, not somebody who um, is picking up uh, a hammer that you somehow don't um, enjoy or require the benefits of unionism. And we're seeing that change today, right? Where we're seeing workers, um, <coughs> excuse me, of the younger generation organizing at Starbucks and Amazon and uh, Google and places like that. And so I think that culture is changing, but um, I, I thought it would be great for us to sit down with my very good friend, Carmen Izzo, who was our guest today. Uh, and Carmen has a great union story and so, uh, Carmen, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Michael. Um, so I am a clarinetist by trade. I currently live in Boise, Idaho, which is my sort of base of operations, if you will. I moved here in 2015 um, when I won the audition for principal clarinet of the Boise Philharmonic. Uh, at the time, I sort of knew where Idaho was on the map. <laughs> that's about it. I knew nothing about it. And I think a lot of Idahoans want to keep it that way. It's kind of a secret place. Um, so since moving here, I have developed a private studio for teaching lessons. I'm also the bass clarinetist and assistant principal clarinet of the Las Vegas Philharmonic. I teach at two colleges here, uh, Northwest Nazarene University, a small Christian college, and the College of Idaho. Uh, which is one of the best liberal arts colleges in the state of Idaho. Um, very small music department, but I have a lot of really wonderful students who've grown a lot uh, in the past five, six years that I've been there. I'm originally from Chicago. I went to college in Chicago at DePaul University, moved to Los Angeles, went to the University of Southern California, lived in uh, Hyogo Prefecture, Japan for three years and played in the Hyogo Performing Arts Center Orchestra. Um, and these days, when it's not serving as president of the, one of the newest locals of the AFM, American Federation of Musicians, I freelance and play a whole lot of different places around the country. So uh, post COVID, if there ever will be such a thing, but sort of post 2020, 2021, has been some of the most busy times of my life, playing, teaching, doing a million different things. That's exciting. Um, and I should mention that you are the president of the Greater Idaho Musicians Association, also known as uh, AFM, American Federation of Musicians, Local 423. Yes. <clears throat> so I um, want to get that uh, information in there. So um, in your work, uh, in your studies, right? You're going to school in Chicago. What was your first connection to union, unionism for artists or union work? Or when did you even become aware of uh, the fact that we as musicians have a union? Well, in Chicago, I believe it's local 10208. Yeah. We had the president at the time, and I don't remember who it was, or it was a local officer of some sort came to visit one of our classes. So DePaul University School of Music is really great in that the faculty is largely either Chicago Symphony, Lyric Opera, or Chicago freelancers who are doing all the teaching. And one of the classes is um, like a music business class. It's very condensed, but they taught us all about taxes, filing self-employment taxes, 1099 and all that, uh, how to make it as a freelancer. And one of the things, one day of class, uh, this local officer came and talked to us. Now, 
I sort of understood why if you were playing in a professional orchestra, there was a union involved, but it was never really explained to me why anyone else or why like the history behind things as to why this is so important as to why this is a benefit. And it was kind of sold to us in a really uh, transactional way. You know, if you guys sign up now, I'll get you the student rate in the back of my head. I'm like, I'm not playing very many gigs. I'm a junior in college. Why do I need to pay X number of dollars a year for something that I don't think is going to help me? So that was my first exposure. Um, you know, more or less throughout the years, I sort of had this attitude of don't, you don't need to join the musicians union in any city you live in until you need to join, until you're playing a job that is represented by the local chapter in whatever city that is. And I just never really had that need until um, I think it was my first year playing here in Boise. I took a gig in Chicago. I still go back to Chicago and take the occasional gig there where it, membership is required to take certain gigs and a certain type of work. And so the first local I joined was the Chicago local, uh, really mm -hmm. just one gig. But then I eventually started playing a little bit more over there and there was a you know, I still at that point really only saw it as this thing that we all do and you're all supposed to do under certain circumstances. But, you know, you're probably going to get to this, but being in an orchestra, the Boise Philharmonic, which was not organized at that point, which had no union representation, I started to realize very much why it's important. Yeah, and I think um, a lot of us have a similar experience where um, you're aware that like when I was in New York City, for example, there was a cultural expectation that you would join Local 802 if you wanted to do any work on Broadway, for example, um, subbing work. And so while it's technically illegal to require union membership before employment, um, it was kind of the culture. And I think it's probably the same in Chicago where it's like, well, I know the top two contractors who are hiring for the uh, Oriental Theater and the Cadillac Theater in Chicago. And if I want to do any sub work or get hired to do Wicked or, or Hamilton, I know that I'm going to have to join because they're not even going to look at my resume or, or talk to me if they don't think that I'm in the union, right? So um, there is that kind of like a transactional connection. And I think there's also like, we think about like institutions like the Chicago Symphony where you're like, okay, well, that's a union orchestra. But we never, we never figure out like why. We never say, well, right. how long have they been union? And how did they become union? It just, it's just like a fact of nature. It's like, well, that's a union job, or maybe this isn't over here. And so we have, we have this kind of like association mentality where it's like, it's like a, an association or a professional guild that we're joining. And what we don't have is an experience of being a union, right? right. Um, in terms of, of the formation of a union, and so. I think it's important to remember that that's still happening today um, in all kinds of fields. And um, it certainly happened in Boise with the Boise Philharmonic, right? And so why don't you give us a little bit of a context of the Boise Philharmonic when you arrived with your colleagues with, you know, you, you, you didn't have um, any union representation at that time, right? Right. So when I arrived, there was sort of a skeleton of infrastructure that a lot of other orchestras have. There was a master agreement. So there was some sort of contract, uh, you know, 30, 40 pages about the policies and procedures. There was an orchestra committee which represented the musicians and would sort of negotiate with board members and administration of the contents of that. And uh, you know, like any 501c3, you know, there's a board on the management side who makes a lot of the decisions. There's a staff and management structure beneath the board that sees the day-to-day -day operations. The thing is, as we would go into these negotiations of sort, when the contract would expire, there really wasn't any leverage or any power that our representatives had. They would go and exchange proposals and, you know, it was always a bit of a cluster mess with how that would happen in that our representatives would 
put forth a proposal about wages and attendance and, you know, things that go typically into a contract and management would completely rewrite the entire document, you know, put things would be in different places and um, it would be completely disorganized, making it a real pain for anyone involved to actually, you know, go through the document. I mean, you're familiar when you're negotiating a, a contract, usually it's on specific points unless there's a real need to completely change the language i mean usually it's about things of substance that both sides are trying to work through so it's very kind of focused on certain issues and so it was it was always this sort of i don't know negotiation and name only and that the things that the musicians would get out of it they'd only get through either some kind of like phone campaign or pressure campaign to management um, or really if the other side felt like we deserved it or something. I, I don't know. It was strange. I was never an orchestra committee representative at the time, but many of my close friends um, were. And I can think of a few instances. There was a time where during the beginning of a negotiation at the end of a contract, the other side of the aisle the board management at the time said, oh, yeah, we're looking to do some percentage raise for all musicians, but we want to save the financial things to the end of this negotiation. Well, of course they get through everything. And then by that point, management decides to say, actually, we can't afford anything. Mm. So you have orchestra committees members basically pleading and saying, well, can you do 2%? Can you do 1%? can you do $1 on the per service rate? And I think that's what management like hemming and hawing finally agreed to. So it's that there's no recourse. There's no accountability in these negotiations, whereas you're familiar, there are certain rules of the game that go into play when you have a collective bargaining agreement. There's a whole set of laws that deal with how these things work and which is a great thing. Um, there was also a time where we had, you know, just sort of an informal committee trying to get commuters of the orchestra. So it, Boise Philharmonic is a uh, sort of half salaried musician or less than half salaried musicians. And the bulk of it is per service players. By and large, the folks who win auditions for this or uh, for this orchestra these days are from out of town. But mm. they receive no mileage, no per diem, anything like that we were trying to advocate for having that happen. Folks would come in and they'd play the job for a year or less than a year and they would bail because it, they weren't making any money. Yeah. Make. And so we got them to agree. We got management to agree to some kind of small travel stipend after three meetings. Okay. This sounds like a great idea. A great idea. They come back a month later and say, oh, we never agreed to that. What are you talking about? Why would we agree to that? There's just no accountability for encouraging growth. There is no accountability and recourse for dishonesty on mm. the process of trying to make our place of employment grow and thrive. And so seeing things like that and also spending time in Las Vegas, where I've participated in a contract negotiation, made me realize something needs to change. Yeah. And I think uh, what's interesting about your situation in Boise was that you had the illusion of some sort of influence because there was a structure in place and there was some sort of contract. Um, but you had no way of really you had no power to enforce it, it sounds like. That's right. Especially, you know, it's really like the power of law, the power of the infrastructure of having a greater network of the AFM. There's so much more. We have more muscle, more teeth behind our um, musicians now in our contract. Yeah. Um, and so uh, how did you all begin the process where you're, you, you decided that something's not working here and... Um, how do we hold our management accountable? So this, it's been tried before in Boise with different folks who had different issues. I mean, there have just been issues throughout the years where the musicians felt like decisions were being made that affected them more than anyone and anything. 
and yet they had no say in the matter. So it was several times this issue has come up over and over and it just never like materialized or it wasn't quite the right time for it. Um, what happened, some of this started at my kitchen table across the room here and my partner, mm -hmm. Alison Emmerich, uh, who's principal flute in the orchestra here, was asking about what it was like to negotiate with a local officer down in Vegas. And then also at the time, a negotiator from the AFM who was very organized, who was tough as nails. It was Chris Durham, peace be upon him. Uh, so it was, it was interesting seeing the kind of power we had behind these negotiations and the kind of uh, legal circumstances that go into it. So when I was talking about this with my partner, she said, we need to get this going. We need this to happen. So reached out to the AFM. I think she emailed the entire, I don't know if it was the international executive board or just everyone in the New York office uh, spoke to Stephen Chung, who was in local 689 Eugene. And eventually we get noticed. And so yeah. that's when yourself and Todd Jelen eventually get flown out courtesy the AFM to talk about what we could do to start something here. Yeah. And so we did some work with your committee and, um, you know, I think the, the key that a lot of people mistake when they think about how unions, um, how workers uh, come together as a union in their workplace is that um, they think, well, let's just call up so-and-so and have them come in here and, you know, uh, you know, uh, wave, wave a stick or whatever and just make it happen for us, right? And it never works that way. Um, so it's really about uh, the workers doing the work. So um, your committee was, I think, four or five people at the start, right? Right. And I, I should say, I make it sound like, th like this was like my idea or something. It was not at all. There was, you know, Allison and I, we reached out to three or four colleagues we knew would be sympathetic to motion in this direction. And we talked about it and we got on a conference call and then finally met with you all. And what this materialized was as a campaign of gradually including more and more folks in the orchestra and, you know, sort of getting their story about what, what was their experience in the Boise Philharmonic and seeing how a different way of dealing with things, having AFM representation could bring about a real positive change. Yeah. And I should say that like, um, you know, you can't, what, one of the adages that we have in, in labor is that, you know, it's really hard to organize people who ha are content, right? So if the Boise Philharmonic had been a better management or if they had been just more professional in their treatment of you, there may not have been any issues, right? Like, but in this case, you all woke up and said, nothing's gonna change unless we do something. And um, you had some conversations with all your colleagues and you found some commonality in, in the very different experiences that people were having. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that is compelling and uh, notable about organizing in the realm we do is that a lot of times we're working with uh, partial or part-time employment, right? Or, or not a full-time job. And so the Boise Philharmonic doesn't, it provides a, a substantial uh, chunk of work for classical musicians but it's by no means full time, right? Um, right. I mean, when I started, my salary was eighteen thousand dollars. <laughs> you know, yeah, so like yeah. you have to do something else um, if you want to have some semblance of a comfortable living in, you know, two thousand fifteen or whenever it was that I started. Yeah, and you have musicians who are also in different locations, yes. um, but you all did it, and you came together and. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that uh, we always want to do uh, in thinking about what a campaign looks like, right, 
is something called inoculation. Do you want to talk a little bit about inoculation? Yeah, sure. So throughout this campaign of talking to each other, and that's and that's really what this was, was getting everyone's story and seeing like, what is your issue and what can be done about that in a different set of circumstances. And inoculation is basically introducing ideas of what might happen or how might management respond or how might our colleagues respond once we come forth and go public and say, this is what we want and this is what we're going to vote to achieve. And so when you hear the word union, there's a lot of preconceived notions. There's a lot of misconceptions. There's a lot of sort of mythology that goes along with it. Well, if you're in a union, you have to do X. Or if you're in a union, that means you can't fire people. There's a lot of, there's like a whole laundry list of sort of talking points. You know, you turn on any news channel and there's like talking points, right? It's this like unfortunate, like misrepresentation of what the truth is. And so talking with each other and understanding what might our management say to us when we go to them and how much of that is just fluff or scare tactics and how much of it they might say something or do something, but they don't actually have that power. I mean, there's so many things that are not legal when trying to break up a campaign to unionize. There's so many protections. It's just that folks don't necessarily know about them. So we'd have these meetings where either yourself or, you know, Todd Jelen would have a whole presentation on, you know, this is what the law says. This is what has happened in previous organizing campaigns. There was a, uh, a series of videos that we always, we still reference here um, that were sort of classic union buster, uh, examples of union busting in a workplace and having people prepared for that. And I think, you know, even though we didn't really see that in our campaign, it was good for folks to witness that in a very kind of safe and controlled environment where it was just other musicians. We're not being pulled into someone's office. Yeah, and I think um, in the world of the arts, one of the effective strategies that can be employed by a management um, is to sort of tap into our own uh, sort of scarcity mindset about our work and like um, the messages we tell ourselves, right? Like that, well, unlike Beyonce, we actually don't cover our costs or make money when we sell out a concert hall. Um, it, it, it still costs more money and we depend on donations and we're lucky to play and we shouldn't ask for more because it's a nonprofit and they're not making a profit and all of these things. And so um, I think it's really empowering when people can overcome that, which is not only a, a boss message in some ways, but it's also the message that becomes kind of ingrained in our own heads as as artists and we have this idea that like well if you know i'm i'm lucky to get to play um brahms for anywhere right um versus like i need to stand up for my rights even understanding that i feel blessed to be able to do something i love you know right it's sort of leveraging your passion against you like don't you love this like why would you why would you need more money for this right. as if you can't love what you're being paid to do in some way you know it, it's it, it's very strange and that i've i've heard this not just from management but from musicians who are concerned about taking a step in this direction that somehow they don't deserve to be paid what they're worth and i don't know where that comes from but I mean, it's a, it's a skill, it's a trade, and it's very often being marketed as this really wonderful, powerful thing that like these musicians are the best in Idaho, or these are the best musicians in Los Angeles or, or wherever it is. It's being marketed as this really high class and super skilled thing that we should cherish. But then on the flip side, when you try to you know negotiate what you believe you to be worth, you know, all of a sudden that can go out the window. Yeah. Um, so when you were talking with your colleagues uh, 
in Boise around forming a union, how did you manage or how did you respond when they would come to you with those messages um, around, I'm just lucky to play, there's nothing else here, and I would do anything to play violin in the orchestra or whatever, whatever their message might have been? The best thing you can do, I think, with all humans, all people, is to get their story and just keep them talking. Yeah. Because it's, you know, it, the most bright-eyed and bushy-tailed person there is, they're going to have something that they're upset about. You know, it's not all sunshine and rainbows, especially for artists. There's so few opportunities for the arts in relation to how many artists there are in all disciplines of art, especially music where you, you know, you can't hit the save button. You know, you have to come together, perform a live concert and that opportunity doesn't exist after that. Right. So I think the more you get folks talking, the more you can talk about, the more they'll reveal their own experience and the things that they had trouble with or the things that they were frustrated by and how it relates to their daily life. Well, they might really care about the orchestra. I mean, let's let's face it, folks who are playing in a professional orchestra, they all do care. They're playing this music that they've spent their lives studying. So they all care. That being said, um, I think someone is always going to run into some sort of situation that didn't quite go their way. And you can uh, have them talk about that and see what, why do they still have dissatisfaction with that? Why are they still upset about some event that might've been from years past? And I think a large part of what we uncovered is that folks felt like they didn't have a real voice or a real say in the direction of how the organization, the orchestra grew. Yeah. You know, for example, like, Boise, Idaho is one of those like fastest growing cities in America that you see on yeah. the little kind of clickbait articles. And it's really true the the population, the um, medium household income keeps going up and up while our wages were really stagnant. Our programming uh, was sort of limited to X number of masterworks concerts. And, mm -hmm. you know, I see a lot of these larger orchestras around the country playing with Ben Folds or voice to men. Um, and, you know, we, we would never do anything cool like that, you know. And so, yeah. like, what very often would happen is a decision would be made at kind of a high level, like at the board level. And the musicians will say, well, have you thought of doing X? Have you thought of doing a concert here or hiring X guest artist? And it would always be dismissed. And so the lack of having any real voice in that conversation I think everyone kind of centered around that. So even if someone had a preconceived notion about what union representation would look like, you can always find a way to circle back and talk to them about, well, hold on. Remember this situation where it didn't go our way and we tried to say something that was completely dismissed. Even if it was in the contract, you know, we had this contract for years and years, but the only way to really enforce that contract was for our orchestra committee, which had zero budget. It didn't collect dues of any kind. Let's go out and hire a lawyer. Now, mm -hmm. who's going to now chip in for that? Yeah. And how long is that going to take and all of those questions? Right. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that um, I think you all did, um, talk a little bit about the fact that you decided to um, form a local because there was no AFM presence. There was no musicians union in Idaho at the time. Right. Right. And, you know, after beginning, after being sort of recognized by our board at the end of our campaign, which really seems like the middle of the campaign, because they still had to negotiate a new agreement. Um, we were in the jurisdiction of the local from Eugene, Oregon, which is like seven or eight hours driving from here. Wow. So it would be, we'd create, we would sort of be represented by folks who weren't here, who we don't know personally. And so it made the most sense to have representatives be us, to represent ourselves and to make decisions based on 
what's happening here. So Boise, Idaho, for those who don't know, is really quite uh, remote in a sense. And that the closest big city would be Salt Lake City, which is about four or five hours driving. And there's not a whole lot in between here and there. And yeah. then if you go south, you know, Las Vegas is nine hours. And wow. if you go west, Portland is maybe seven hours. Seattle is about nine hours driving. And there's a whole lot of sort of empty, either high desert or just agriculture. So there's not much in between. And there's sort of this, I think in Idaho in general, there's a sense that like, this is like, this is our place and we do things our way. I mean, the, the political situation is very much so. It's, it's a little bit like isolationist in the sense that like, when all the Californians move in and pay cash for houses, there's kind of a nativist like reaction to that. Like there's too many Californians here. And I, I kind of understand that is like wages remain stagnant and housing prices go way up. I get it. Yeah. Uh, so because we're so isolated, it didn't really make sense to have our representation be so far away. You know, it's nice when you can um, have a local meeting and just, drive 10 minutes to go to the park and you have a barbecue or 10 minutes from the rehearsal hall, something like that. Yeah. Or maybe we've been doing a, uh, a band room at the university where we have run out concerts. So the concerts over, go over, have a local meeting, people pick up snacks, take care of business, you know, get beers afterwards. Yeah. So it's just, it, it, it creates a much more close knit and tight knit community. Um, I've been in other AFM locals before and I've never been to a meeting for any of them I mean like I should be ashamed to say that but one it's usually a place I don't live yeah uh, but two you know it's not usually a, a group of musicians who I'm even familiar with in that circumstance. I feel like suddenly like this wall of shame like <laughs> sending upon me to say that no uh, I think that's a pretty common experience though and um but what was interesting to me about what you all did in Boise was um, not only did you form your own, like forming your own local also allows you to become integrated with the larger labor community where you are. Um, and I think that's something that artists forget to do or they, they think maybe they don't have to do it. But um, that's why I, I try to avoid the word performer or professional and use the term working, right? So if you're a working musician, you know, you're a worker, like let's, that's what you are. And so you have a lot of common interests with other people who are workers, right? Um, in your, in your community. So how have you guys integrated into the labor community in, in Boise? Not as much as we would, like to uh we've participated in one of the annual afl cio conferences but as guests mm -hmm. and i think you know if you have a local of any labor union you can then sort of join and there's you know dues and fees based on your membership and then you have a say in how the afl cio represents its interests uh, politically and um a variety of things but we maintain a relationship um with the Idaho AFL-CAO and sort of get uh, feedback and guidance. Occasionally, usually it's a phone call to one of their organizers and representatives. It's something that we'd like to do more of. Um, and that's the thing is like thinking of oneself as a professional and thinking of oneself as someone who is skilled and brings value, I think can really change the mindset you know, we always encourage folks to negotiate their own fees, their own wages, and to really consider what do you think is right for you to be compensated? How does that relate to other forms of compensation in the area? How does that relate to the country at large and for what you would uh, value yourself doing a different skill for X number of hours? And I think you know, this mindset of working or professional or, or whatnot, I think it's important to have gratitude for mm -hmm. life as a musician, of 
course. You know, like this is pretty awesome that we get to play music and we get compensated for it. That being said, you know, the laws of economics still affect all of that. And so we have to think, you know, dare I say, you know, in this sort of capitalist mindset is like, what can you do to make yourself this great, you know, product, this great thing that you can market yourself as? Because all of the great musicians that we know, popular, classical, or otherwise, like are doing that and they're getting ahead and they're having a good life for doing it. Yeah, I think uh, gratitude and, and knowing and demanding that we be respected for what we value ourselves as is, is key. Um, and I think that um, obviously is something that is even larger than unionism, right? It's like, we just need to, as a, as a community, decide that we need to be respected more. Um, and if you, you know, if you're an artist or someone who is pursuing a solo career, <clears throat> it's no different, right? If, if you have that same mindset. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that's really key. And I would like to ask you, um, because this is a question I am asking myself a lot, is knowing what you know now as a professional who's been out in the field for, I don't know, 10 or so years probably, right? Um, what would you tell the next uh, generation of students at DePaul about the life of a working musician that you wish you knew when you were at DePaul yourself? Well, step one, knowledge is power. Find out everything you can about where you're working and how it functions. Is there a contract? Is there representation? Who are the folks who uh, are contracting you? And mm -hmm. Who do they answer to? So find out as much information as you can and find out information about the laws that govern this. You know, like find out about in various types of employment law, labor law, because that's where a lot of the power lies in labor unions is infrastructure that was built way back in 1935. Um, I think that's the first thing is second is learn to sort of value yourself as a product is like a content creator <laughs> to use a kind of very current moniker content creator but also as the content itself and that's what you can market going forward you know like when you're on the job you know you want to think of yourself as like I worked really hard on this repertoire. I know exactly where I fit in the orchestra and the woodwind section. I know what part of the chord I am. I know what, um, how to blend with this instrument and this instrument and the pitch tendencies and et cetera. And that's, that's sort of like how you value yourself is just how highly skilled you are. And there's real power in that because when people hear really great uh, performances and really great instrumentalists or musicians of any kind, they notice. And I think that's like where some of your leverage is, is what you're bringing to the table. So like, be proud of that and be proud of being highly skilled and, you know, being art itself. Um, yeah. I mean, those like two things, I mean, the more you know about the situation you're entering into and the more you have kind of like facts at your disposal, the more you're going to understand how to function in the workplace. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I could go on and on about this thing. I mean, like the yeah. is knowledge is power. And I just, especially with unions, there's just all these sort of like myths and talking points about it that aren't necessarily true that you kind of have to unpack and see why people think this and why that, where that comes from. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's truly important. And in our world, you know, there's a lot of um, really kind of uh, vague, opaque, um, and just squirrely work that we do sometimes. And like, I'm thinking about, you know, you might get an email from the second violinist in the Boise Phil who says, hey, um, I'm putting an orchestra together for video games live. It's going to be here and here. And you have no idea really like, well, is she going to pay me or who am I really working for? 
what happens if I get hurt on the job? Like who, yeah. who is my, who's really, who is the, um, the, uh, the employer? And then what happens if something goes wrong and, or even something even more basic, like, am I going to get a meal between the rehearsal and the performance? Like, and, um, or am I getting paid for my mileage? Is it going to be recorded? Like there's all these kind of unknowns that I think, um, a lot of folks don't even know to ask about. And I think that's that's a really important thing to bring up is that sometimes asking about or knowing about these things is stressful. A lot of musicians they want to they want to practice their part, learn their music, they want to play the job, enjoy doing it, and then go home and you know feed their kids or you know whatever it is they do for their hobby. And so this whole extra element of trying to figure out all these details, it's stressful. I get it. But the more you know, the more you're in control of your own situation. And so I encourage folks to learn about that ahead of time and learn about it in as many places as possible, because the, you know, the industry standards are very often like how we can influence one workplace or another. It's like, well, hey, having a per diem when we're 40 miles away from our usual concert hall, that's normal. So if gig whatever isn't providing me with that per diem, like maybe I'm not going to do this gig anymore. And then that's yeah. or that creates more of an issue for both the performers and management down the line. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think um, having a kind of um, personal clarity on your mission and what you want to do is going to help inform that. And I think um, there's a point where, we graduate, at least for me, this was true, where you just say yes to everything. And I think, I think that that's understandable. But then there's like that time when you're like, why am I doing this? And you're like, I don't have to do this gig next year or whatever it might be. And, um, you know, I remember, you know, being on a tour in the South, um, like a two week long tour maybe, where I was like dressing up in period costume and I was playing like Susan marches. And I was like, I just want to kill myself. This is not why I went to college and this is not what I want to do with my life. Um, and so you wake up and you're like, well, is this really in line with, with what I want to do and with the kind of music that I want to make? And I think that's really important is the power of saying no. And I think um, a lot of us are afraid to do that, especially when we start out. Right. You don't have to say yes to everything. And I think there is that kind of famine mentality where it's like, oh, I have to, I have to say yes to this gig, otherwise so and so is going to take it, and it's it's an unfortunate mentality because yes, there are more musicians out there than there are available jobs or gigs. Um, sometimes it's important to say no because it sends a message. You know, it's sort of there are a lot of like really shitty employment scenarios where you're getting paid a terrible wage. Uh, they make you feel bad if you can't play the February concert or whatnot. But you're really not happy doing this gig. But the more you keep saying yes to working for them without raising a stink, the more you're telling them it's okay. What you're doing is not wrong. It's just this sort of weird uh, abusive relationship situation where, you know, if you don't leave, they have no reason to believe that what they're doing is wrong. Yeah. And I think it's a balance. I mean, I, I had John Miller on last week, who is a very successful contractor and bass player in New York City. And, you know, his message was, you, you got to show up and you got to be out there. And he gave a really good example of a young 19 year old um, musician. And uh, he was as a contractor, he was in a bind. And he was desperate. There was a show called Fosse, huge jazz, major solo trumpet parts, and had about five hours to find somebody uh, when somebody was taken ill, couldn't play the show, and had gotten a name of a young student and resisted. But then finally, um, you know, their teacher persuaded them to give this guy a chance. And he said, I gave him a Broadway show within two months because he was a monster player. But I only knew about him because everybody else knew about him because they were playing. Um, but so there is a balance, I think, but you have to be doing the work that is going to advance your career, I think. Um, for me, it wasn't playing the Susan Marches. That wasn't really going to do anything for my resume. Um, 
but like playing chamber music or or going to a festival and making connections there's like when you when you show up and do things that are serving your own goals i think that's different than just as you say showing up out of fear um i need the money or so and so is going to get the work if i don't do it right yeah yeah i mean it's it's really interesting also to realize like we're in a community and i think things that there's very often thing times where our interests are the interests of a lot of our colleagues around us and so it's important to talk to your colleagues um, even about uncomfortable things like like what are you getting paid for this gig because maybe it's the same maybe it's not and maybe the reason it's not is ne isn't necessarily a good reason uh, so it's important because we're most of us are in more of the same situation uh, than we realize in just being a performing and working musician it's like our life circumstances are probably more similar than you think especially taking the same kind of gigs everywhere and I think there's strength in communication there's strength in working together um yeah it's just, it's important to communicate and not feel isolated in this yeah field, in any field yeah and i think um you know to get back to our theme of of why artists need a union there is this kind of message and it's um it's a very uh, ingrained romanticized American value, right? That we are all, uh, we're all individuals and um, we all are responsible for our own success. We have to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And, um, you know, that, that magnified to a toxic degree kind of explains why we're where we are in a lot of ways in our society, where you get people that are like, well, I don't want to wear a mask or I'm not going to get a vaccine because there's no sense of like, of, of like public good or collective, whereas unions really are, you know, about collective power. And, you know, you can say like, yeah, I do want to be the best violinist, the best clarinetist in the world. And I do have a unique musical gift to offer and I have a unique voice, but I know that my power is coming together with my colleagues, right? Like that's at the end of the day, it's really about what we do together. And that goes against what we're taught, right? And what what is exploited by, you know, our society that is so focused on capitalism and not focused on collective good, right? That, oh, you don't need a union, you can do it yourself, right? It's that kind of attitude. Yeah, well, and I think also at the same time, you can find ways to run them as parallels, right? Like we want to, you know, we have to focus on ourselves as like valued, you know, we have to focus on advancing our own career, but working together can also do that at the same time. It's this kind of intelligent selfishness that I think we should all remember. It's like when we work together, we're not just doing this for some like kumbaya, let's all be friends. You know, we're doing this because it serves everyone's interests. Like we're all going to benefit out of this situation. And it's, you know, we hear this phrase like pull yourself up by your bootstraps and which, which is fine, but also what if you don't have any boots? You know, what, yeah. what, like, what are the rules of the game? If the rules of the game are completely bupkis, then like, okay, then there's a problem there. And I think having your voice heard and, and interacting with your colleagues is a way to say, all right, this game that we're playing, that we're being told we can win at, like the, like everything is, the deck is stacked against us. Yeah. You know? So at least, at least I, I'm taking kind of very moderate view um, yeah, but I think it's important for folks to hear this in that, you know, we we're all in the society and there's sort of rules of the game. But like, let's let's assess what the rules are, because like we all want to win or at least like be successful in some way. And a lot of the times if if all the, the pawns in the game, you know, don't like are kind of working against each other, then there's there's no way it's going to change. Yeah, um, I think that's right. And the other thing about that narrative is it's it's often just not true, right? Like I think about um, uh, the author Ayn Rand and I went through a phase where I was reading a lot of her work. Uh, I think everybody does between 18 and 22. Oh, I and... totally skipped that over. So I don't know what's wrong with all you people. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I don't know what's wrong with you. But like her whole narrative was about how the individual was everything. And she had this narrative of, well, I, 
I made myself and I, I came here with nothing. When in fact, she had relatives in the United States. She was totally the recipient of, uh, of goodwill and charity of others and help. And um, and so I think I think there's like we have to like remember that like yes all of these things are true, um, but that also that idea that like we're all self-made is a little bit romanticized and and not quite totally true. Right. I mean, you know, it's there are so many things that we owe to our teachers, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so much of music instruction is is like this lineage you get this from your teacher who got it from their teacher who got it from their teacher and then many of us have multiple lineages through different instructors um you know the families that we grow up in you know i had a family of not professional musicians but they're chicago symphony subscribers for decades and so that obviously had some kind of influence in my musical career and then the school that you go to, while I have so many problems with how academia is being run, at least there is an institution that focuses on your betterment, your growth, your development, your professional advancement. So there's so many things we get from surrounding ourselves with qualified, uh, interesting and wonderful people. So we have to remember that like, the idea of you, the idea of what a person is, is very much a, a, a kind of collection of aggregates. It's getting very um, Buddhist here. But yeah. like in a very real sense, an artist especially is that, is that you have different teachers, different cities you lived in, and that forms what you are. And it's the same thing being, you know, considering yourself as a professional, as a worker, is that so many things went into creating what you are. And the thing is, you can then take the parallel and take the opposite side. That is why you are worth what you are worth. Because yeah. you are more than just the sum of all these parts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's, I think, a really uh, profound point, the fact that we are all the sum of, of many other parts, right? I mean, uh, I had, a, a lot of amazing coincidences in my life uh, that helped make me the successful musician that I that I that I was and am, um, and uh, and there are people that are mentors for us, and none of us are really um, you know we we're not alone in this at all. Um, so that's a great insight. Um, I want to thank you, Carmen, um, for taking the time to share with me today, and uh, all of our listeners and. Is there anything you want to end on as we as we close here? I don't have anything extra profound or interesting <laughs> to say. I, te I tend to like just go on and on. And every time I'm in a meeting, it sounds like this. So um, I'm very sorry you all had to put up with me <laughs> throughout this podcast. <laughs> no, it's been a, a pleasure having you. And I appreciate your perspective and your insight. And I think it's important for people, especially artists, to remember that um, labor organizing and unions are not museum pieces. It's happening today. It's happening now. And um, your example with the Boise Philharmonic is like a great reminder of that, that um, we are constantly having to work to make sure that we are collectively getting what we need as artists, um, even today. Definitely. So thank you so much, Carmen. I. Um, Look forward to seeing you again when you're next in Las Vegas. And until then, stay well, and we will see everybody next time. Likewise. Take care. Take care. <laughs>